button icon. So if you, if you want to switch to Mandarin, you can choose either English or Chinese, uh, which is Mandarin services for today. I will be seeing the same slide. How many people are you expecting? Uh, so we, uh, as of last night, we have uh, 83 people registered. Wow, that's a lot. And the capacity is 100. So far, I have admitted 41 participants. Thanks, Polly. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Alan. So I'm the chair of the Chinese Reno Associations. Uh, so it's uh, two o'clock at this point. Uh, so we're still admitting some people to the workshop. Uh, in the meantime, uh, today we have, uh, I'll explain about the translation uh, services today. So we have both offering both Chinese uh, in Mandarin uh, and also English for today's uh, webinar. So you can check the, your Zoom services. If you're on a computer, you will see at the bottom, there's an interpretations icon. Uh, you can, from there, you can pick either you want to listen to in English or in Chinese. 
So before we start, uh, maybe you want to change the channel before we go going through the slide. Come on, the young Gondom, my Gonzilla. Come here, and I got home. Come on, hey, uh, one son, John Gagan, uh, one son, John Mujo, he will get Jesus, and I have her son. And come for the gum door, I come and do, uh, come at the Gondola, or the learning jones or hoi cigala. Come on, a hot thing, say hoi cigi, come on, come here, hey, would fun be your young man, not tong my, uh, potong white, get fun yet. Come, you got a song, get tang fun. 要睇下想聽英文定聽講誒普通話，咁你可以喺誒、呃、你個 Zoom 嗰度咧揀翻個 interpretation， 揀翻啱嘅 channel 咧，咁你就會聽得到噶啦。So maybe we can start now. Um, so welcome everyone again. Um, uh, so maybe I'll talk about the Chinese Reno Associations uh, quickly. Uh, so we were founded in 1997. Uh, we are now part of the Kidney Foundations of Canada. Uh, we have volunteers in Toronto who are committed to provide education, information, and support to the Chinese communities. And uh, CRA includes uh, doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, dietitians, healthcare workers, patients, and caregivers. And in the past, uh, we have uh, hosted Kenya Awareness Day, Chinese New Year dinner, fundraising concerts, and uh, many other education workshops. And today is one of the online workshops that we're offering to the Chinese communities. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy that we have Dr. Robert Ting uh, as one of our key speakers. Dr. Ting is a nephrologist in Scarborough for 28 years, and he is also the past president of Ontario Medical Association, sections of nephrologists and medical staff associations of the China Scarborough Health Network. He is also the medical advisor of Ontario Chinese Renal Associations. And on a, on a personal level, Dr. Ting uh, is married with two kids and both are uh, now doing medicines. Um, Dr. Ting himself has done medical missions in Kenya, Angola, Myanmar, Cambodia, and China. He is also the current Dean of Medicines track for Christian Medical Dental Education Commissions providing continued medical educations for medical commissioners across Africa and Asia. So we are about to begin. Uh, I just want to ask everyone, please mute your mic. Uh, and I will now pass the platform to Dr. Ting. Uh, we have a very heavy agenda today. He has over 80 slides. Um, and we will do the Q&A in the uh, last 10 minutes. So uh, Dr. Ting, uh, please, uh, uh, you may begin. Thank you so much for the invitation from the Chinese Renal Association and uh, for your dedication to helping uh, advance education for all our patients. Today I'm going to talk about management of chronic renal failure and um, during the daytime my job mostly is to look after a lot of patients on dialysis and I hope that from this talk that you guys will learn about how to look after your kidneys and basically how to avoid dialysis for as long as possible. Um, we're going to talk about people with chronic kidney disease are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And uh, we're going to talk about how to look for reversible causes of kidney failure. And then we're going to spend most of the time on how to slow the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease. And then finally, we're going to look at management of some of the other problems that you can get when you have kidney disease. So I'm going to start off with two patients. And this normally, if I had polling, I would ask you what you guys think. The first patient has been diabetic for 10 years. His kidney function, though, is good. His GFR is 90. Albin creatinine ratio is 2, which is normal. The second patient is not diabetes. It has no diabetes, but his GFR is now is only 30. It's one third of the kidney function of the first patient and the albumin creatinine ratio is two. So the question is which of these two patients is more likely to have a heart attack? The patient that's been diabetic for 10 years or the patient that has one third of normal kidney function? So patient two. the question is which of these two patients is more likely to have more likely to have a heart attack? Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting echo and, uh, and uh, someone's, can someone turn off their um, themselves because I'm getting a lot of echo. I think it's Linda Chalk. Can you turn off your, yeah, can you mute, thank you. So um, basically 
who's at higher risk. So if you look at the bottom line, people that have previous heart attacks uh, um, is in the first column. Second column is diabetic with chronic kidney disease. Third column, chronic kidney disease alone. Fourth column, diabetes. And fifth column is normal patients without diabetes or chronic kidney disease. And you can see that someone that has had a previous heart attack, their mortality rate is actually lower than someone that is diabetic with chronic kidney disease. So this just tells you if you're diabetic and you have chronic kidney disease, you really have to look after all the aspects of vascular disease. So your blood pressure, your cholesterol, smoking, all these things have to be treated very, very aggressively. So to answer our first question, these patients are equivalent. So having diabetes for 10 years is just as bad as someone with one third of normal kidney function. Now we add a third patient now. Say the patient has an intermediate kidney function, 50% of normal, but now has a lot of protein in the urine. Now, which patient is more likely to have a heart attack? And you can first patient, second or third patient. And now you can see that the third patient is more likely to have a heart attack. So even though their kidney function is not as bad as the second patient, having a lot of protein in the urine is a bad predictive factor for adverse event. Okay, why is that? It's in the urine, we can actually measure the vascular health of the blood vessels in the kidneys. And basically what we see here is when you have a lot of protein in the urine, we know the blood vessels are not healthy. And the blood vessels, if they're not healthy in the kidney, they're also not healthy in the heart and they're not healthy in the brain. So people with a lot of protein in the urine are at increased risk for heart attacks and for strokes. Now, in general, if people are on dialysis, their chance of dying is much higher. So you can see in a young population uh, in their 20s and 30s, you can see that someone that's on di dialysis is 1,000 times more likely to die than someone in the general population. And even over the age of 85, they're about five times more likely than someone in the general population to die. So basically, we have to treat very, very aggressively to try to keep people off dialysis. Um, and try to preserve their chronic kidney, preserve their kidney function. This graph just shows you uh, going from a little bit of protein, normal, no, nothing, to a little bit micro, to a lot of protein. You can see that as your protein urea goes up, your chance of having cardiovascular mortality goes up. As your kidney function declines from 90, 60 to 90, and less than 60, you can see that as the kidney function declines going from left to right, then the bars go higher. So your chance of dying also goes higher. So we know that as your kidney function goes lower and as the protein urea goes higher, then your chance of cardiovascular mortality starts to go up. And people with low kidney function going from a GFR of 60 down to a GFR of 15 are more likely to die, more likely to have cardiovascular events and more likely to have hospitalization, all right? so. Um, this, this just illustrates the importance of trying to preserve your kidney function as much as possible and to treat all the cardiovascular risk factors. As your kidney function drops, you're much more likely to have high blood pressure, much more likely to have an inability to walk a quarter mile, and your calcium levels then generally fall, you become anemic, your hemoglobin drops lower, and you likely become more malnourished with low serum albumin and your phosphorus levels tend to go up. So if you look at here, <clears throat> the um, age standardized rate, rate of death, as your kidney function goes down, GFR from 60 down to 15, you're much more likely to have uh, cardiovascular events. And if you look at the amount of protein in the urine, this is a study done in children, you can see that small amounts of protein, mid middle intermediate and high amounts of protein, as protein urea goes up, um, there's increased risk of uh, developing kidney failure in children. And this just shows you as protein urea goes up, it's a predictor of mortality in type two diabetic patients. So when we look at protein in the urine, uh, we don't really do 24 hour urine collections anymore. So most of you, when you get a lab rec, your doctor will order a spot urine for albumin creatinine ratio. And the normal levels are less than two in men and 2.8 in women. And if you go higher uh, to two to 20 in men, 2.8 to 28 in women, it's called microalbuminuria. 
above 20 in men and above 28 in women, it's called clinical albuminuria. What we mean by clinical albuminuria or macroalbuminuria is when we dip your urine on, with a dipstick, we will actually see protein in the urine. And you can see that people uh, that start off initially with diabetes have normal protein in the urine. And over time, they start developing micro and eventually will develop macroalbuminuria. And they have a higher risk of uh, kidney failure. And it not only predict, predicts heart attacks, so if you have a little bit of protein in your urine, it predicts heart attacks. It also predicts stroke. And basically, this slide just shows you that if you're diabetic with proteinuria, you're more likely to have uh, uh, mortality if you have proteinuria than if you don't have proteinuria. So if you have protein in urine, it's basically just a marker of a vascular disease. And this study just shows that very tiny amounts of protein in the urine. I already told you 2.0 is normal, but even going from 1 to 1.3, you can see that the risk of cardiovascular disease starts to go up. So very small increases in proteinuria can confer increased cardiovascular risk. And you can see that basically as your kidney function drops, your chance of dying goes up, increased cardiovascular mortality, increased kidney failure, uh, et cetera. So how do we define chronic kidney disease? It's really a reduction in GFR. Usually the GFR is less than 60 and often it's associated with proteinuria. And it's quite common, about one in seven uh, adults, um, 37 million in the US and Canada, it's over 3 million. Uh, three and a half million in Canada will have chronic kidney disease. And unfortunately, most people with chronic kidney disease don't even know they have chronic kidney disease. So a lot of people that have this problem don't even know they have it. And you can see that over the age of 65, 38% of the people in the population will actually have chronic kidney disease. It's uh, a little bit more common in uh, certain races, especially black people. Uh, and you can see the percentages there. And this is how we stage uh, kidney function. Um, generally, your kidney function drops by about one ml per minute per year of life. So a good way to figure out what a normal GFR would be is you take 140 and you subtract your age. So for example, for an 80 year old person, normal GFR would be 60. For a 90 year old person, normal GFR would be 50. Uh, so basically your kidney function tends to drop as you get older. The GFR where you need dialysis is usually around eight or seven. So when it drops below eight or seven, then you need to start renal replacement therapy. So what are the causes of uh, kidney disease? Um, diabetes is still the number one cause, uh, accounting for almost half the cases and high blood pressure as well. And most diabetics also have high blood pressure. Small number have a hereditary condition called polycystic kidney disease. And glomerular disease as a percentage has been going down over time. So we'll start off with the case. This is a 54 year old lady. Back six years ago, her creatinine was 97. She had very little proteinuria. Six years later, her creatinine is now up to 165 and she has 1.8 grams of protein. Her sugars are not well controlled. Hemoglobin would see 7.6%. Blood pressure is 145 on 90. So when we look at people with kidney disease, we have to look at reversible causes. Pre-renal means that we're looking at problems with poor perfusion of the kidney, either the blood pressure is too low or the patient is just not circulating their blood properly. They may have a bad heart, they may have liver problems or leaking a lot of protein in the urine. We also have to make sure you're not taking certain drugs. So a lot of over-counter drugs, the so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these could be drugs like ibuprofen or Advil or Motrin. These are, even though they're over-the-counter drugs, they're actually very bad for your kidneys because they lower the blood flow to your kidneys. So you have to be careful. For a lot of people with kidney disease, the only safe pain medicine really is probably Tylenol. And even there, you probably don't want to take more than three grams per day. Um, but a lot of anti-inflammatory drugs are very, very bad for your kidneys because they lower the blood flow to your kidneys by blocking prostaglandins. The other thing is uh, if you have a very high calcium level, that tends to reduce the blood flow to your kidneys. So these are sort of things that are potentially reversible. 
post renal is aft beyond the kidney, we really talking about blockage of the kidney. So either from kidney stones or a large prostate, somehow the urine is being made, but is unable to drain from the kidney properly. So one of the things that you guys, if you have chronic kidney disease and you have hypertension is you'll be on a drug called an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Examples of ACE inhibitors are drugs like perindopril or coversil, uh, Mavic or trandolopril or um, lisinopril and allopril, that type of drug. And then ARBs are so-called sartan drugs. So losartan, valsartan, herbosartan, tell me sartan. These are sartan drugs. And these are really the first line therapy for people with chronic kidney disease, okay? Because not only do they lower blood pressure, but they also lower the protein and they lower the pressure inside the filtering units of the kidney. So they are very, very beneficial. And if you have kidney disease, we want your blood pressure to go less than 130 on 80. And uh, a lot of patients with high blood pressure and kidney disease are gonna need water pills or diuretics, okay? And it's very, very important to maintain a low salt diet. So generally, if you're diabetic and you have kidney disease, we want your sugars under good control, your A1C less than 7%. We want your blood pressure less than 130 on 80. We want to control your bad cholesterol. Your LDL should be less than two. In fact, if you have heart disease and known heart disease, the LDL should be even lower, maybe down to 1.5 or lower, okay? And then we want you on certain drugs. So ACE or ARB, is basically for everyone diabetic over the age of 55, anyone with uh, protein in the urine or heart problems should be on an ACE or ARB. Statins basically for everyone over the age of 40 should be on a statin or if they've had diabetes for more than 15 years. Um, aspirin is now indicated mostly for people that have had a heart attack or stroke. There is an increased risk for GI bleeding. So we don't give aspirin to everyone anymore, but I think in high-risk patients, I think aspirin, baby aspirin is still a good idea. And then we're gonna talk about some new drugs, the so-called SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. And these are very, very good drugs for uh, diabetes. Uh, and finally, we're gonna recommend exercise, healthy eating, uh, quit smoking, and then try to reduce stress in your life. So healthy living. Why do we use ACE inhibitors? This is the Captopril study. This was the first study in 1993, showing that people when they were on an ACE inhibitor versus no ACE inhibitor, there was a huge reduction in kidney failure or death. And this is the uh, Herbisartan diabetic nephropathy trial showing the benefit of Sartans and type two diabetes, uh, a modest reduction, but about 20% lower when you took Herbisartan. And similarly, if in the IDNT study, if you got your blood pressure less than 132, you did much better than, for example, someone's blood pressure was 149. Okay, they didn't do as well. So the higher your blood pressure, the worse you're going to do. So basically, not only take the herbosartan, but get your blood pressure, your top number, systolic pressure to less than 130. And this just shows you the follow-up in terms of the patients with kidney disease going from a blood pressure of 180 down to 120. And you can see that basically the patients that have a blood pressure below 130 do much better than people that have a blood pressure above 130. And the higher your blood pressure, the worse you do. So how do you get the blood pressure down? We recommend people eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. We limit salt to one teaspoon a day. That's total, that including all the salt in all your diet. So you're gonna to have to learn to eat with other spices like garlic or other curry or something else, but you just have to eat less salt, okay? Uh, we encourage people to exercise for at least 150 minutes a week or 40 minutes per session, three to four times a week. We want people to quit smoking. If you smoke, your time to dialysis is reduced by 50%. So no smoking, okay? And basically we want to reduce alcohol consumption. Uh, you should have, you can have up to one alcohol drink per day. So one ounce of hard liquor or one glass of wine. Um, and ideally uh, not more than that. We encourage patients to check their blood pressure to have your own blood pressure monitor. Uh, there's some people that may have sleep apnea. So these are usually men with thick necks uh, very common in Asian people, uh, they tend to snore very heavily. So if they have sleep apnea, they should be tested for it and they should be wearing 
uh, a CPAP machine at nighttime to help them to stop the airway obstruction. So that's 2,300 milligrams of sodium. That's like one teaspoon of salt. And that's all the salt in all the food. So not just what you put in your cooking, but includes all the food that you eat. So you have to get very good at reading the labels uh, on the food. You know, try to prepare your own foods, buy fresh food. Uh, if you buy canned foods, then you should rinse them so to get rid of all the sodium and adding spices. And actually portion control is very important too. If you eat less uh, uh, amounts, then it will be less sodium. So when we do take the ARBs, we lower the protein in the urine and that's a good thing. When we lower protein, we're less likely to develop kidney failure. We're less likely to have cardiovascular events. We're less likely to have heart failure. And similarly with the herpesartan, uh, this is the other sartan study, uh, you can see that ARBs lower protein urea the most. And if you can get the protein down to less than uh, one gram per day, you can see that you have less than 10% chance of going into kidney failure. Whereas the people that had more than eight grams of protein a day, you can see during the course of study, 80% of them develop kidney failure. So getting the protein urea level down as low as possible is very, very important. And people that have a more than 50% decrease in um, protein urea do much better than people that don't have a decrease in protein urea. I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about a new class of drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. And the first uh, study was with canagliflozin. How these drugs work is they block the reabsorption of sugar by the kidney in the proximal tubule. These drugs are very, very important because not only do they tell you, cause you to leak sugar into the urine, but they decrease the pressure inside the filtering units of the kidney. So these drugs mm -hmm. are very, very helpful. And the first study was the Creedon study with canagliflozin or Invocana, 100 milligrams, and they found that when people took the Invocana or canagliflozin in this very low dosage, there was a 30% reduction in kidney failure, uh, doubling of kidney creatinine or uh, patients dying. And you can see that when you take these drugs initially, there's an initial drop in kidney function because they lower the pressure inside the filtering unit of the kidney. But you can see that for the next uh, three, four years, the slope of the rate of decline of kidney function is much slower, such that the, every year you're on this drug, you save about 2.7 mLs uh, of kidney function. So if your GFR started off at 56, as in the study, um, you if you didn't get this drug, you would lose 2.7 mLs faster uh, in the placebo arm than it with the canagliflozin arm. So that's a huge benefit. I would say the difference with these drugs is even greater than what we see with the Sartan drugs or the ARBs, very, very important drugs. There was another study uh, called the DAPA CKD trial. And this study, they looked at not only diabetic patients, but they also looked at non-diabetic patients. And what they found was using also an SGLT2 inhibitor, this one is called Daplogliflozin or a Forziga, there was a 39% reduction in kidney failure. Okay, so these are very, very important drugs for the management of proteinuria and for kidney disease. And you don't have to be diabetic. The benefit was actually even greater in the non-diabetic patients than the diabetic patients, all right? So a 39% reduction in uh, renal endpoints. Recently, there was a study uh, with finerenone, which is a new drug. It's an aldosterone, non steroidal aldosterone antagonist. And basically, it shows also benefit. This drug is still not available in Canada, um, but there is a similar drug called spironolactone, which is in the same family. It's a steroidal drug, um, so that can be used. The main problem with these drugs is they cause elevation in potassium, which can be a limiting factor for lots of our patients, because when you have chronic kidney disease, your ability to get rid of potassium is limited. So you tend to have high potassium already. So that could be a limiting factor with using these drugs. And you can see with spironolactone, it, most of the patients taking spironolactone, uh, the proteinuria drops. So in terms of our patient, we want a lower proteinuria. And Many of you in the uh, questions uh, that you submitted to uh, Shak Yu Fang were talking about proteinuria. So what can you do to lower proteinuria? So for those of you that asked the question, you should be on certain drugs like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, all right? 
um, and you want to lower it, you can add drugs like spironolactone, but you have to monitor your potassium very carefully. And now I think everyone with proteinuria should be on a SGLT2 inhibitor. So the drugs are canagliflozin and dapagliflozin. The other names are Invocana and Forziga. Invocana, I-N-V-O-K-A-N-A. Forziga, F-O-R-X-I-G-A. You can also limit your protein restriction a little bit. We tend not to be very strict on protein restriction just because we feel like the patients need adequate nutrition and um, the amount of time you save by restricting protein is only a few months. Um, and basically we prefer people to be well nourished and we don't want them severely malnourished. It can actually cause more harm. One of the things that we have in people with kidney disease also is they tend to have more calcification in their blood vessels. So calcium goes into the blood vessels. Um, your kidney loses the ability to get rid of phosphorus. So your phosphorus levels tend to go up. You lose the ability to activate vitamin D in your body. You tend to lose the ability to reabsorb calcium in the, bow in the bowels. And you tend to make more protein called parathyroid hormone. And this hormone, what it does is it tries to excrete more phosphorus in your kidney, but in the process, it causes your bones to dissolve over time and your bones become weakened and you can break your bones very easily. So in general, with bone disease uh, and chronic kidney disease, we tell people to limit dietary phosphorus. Phosphorus is found in uh, um, different forms. It can be found in like um, soda drinks like Coca-Cola, can be found in uh, fruit punch. Um, this is probably the worst form of phosphate because 100% of it is absorbed. Phosphate can also be found in animal proteins and there um, about 80% of that is absorbed. On the other hand, if you eat phosphorus in the form of plant proteins, it's poorly absorbed, only about 30%. So in general, we wanna avoid very high protein diets. We wanna avoid milk, dairy products, nuts, um, and, you know, most of you will, uh, if you have severe chronic kidney disease, you will end up seeing a dietitian. And there's a lot of drugs that we use to lower calcium. Your, your kidney specialist may give you drugs like calcium or Renagel or Phosphino or Valforo. These are some of the names, but these are medicines that are taken with your food. And these drugs bind the phosphorus in your diet so you don't absorb it. We also give patients vitamin D analogs. Remember I told you when you have kidney failure, you're not able to activate the vitamin D. You're not able to one alpha hydroxylate your vitamin D. So we give you drugs that are already uh, activated. And also it's very important for most of our patients to get vitamin D supplementation. If you look at most people in Canada, 90% uh, of us have low vitamin D levels, all right? Because we don't get enough sunlight we live in a cold uh, northern latitude uh, country, so half the year we're not outside and very little skin to sun exposure. Um, so you should all be taking probably vitamin D 2000 units a day. Um, and uh, even now with COVID, it's uh, probably important for everyone to take vitamin D 2000 units daily. So I already talked about Coca -Cola, uh, foods that are high in phosphorus. We talked about dairy products, cola drinks, soft drinks in general, uh, nuts, seeds, organ meats, lentils, beans. And we talked about the difference between animal protein and plant protein. So plant protein, much less likely to be absorbed. The other thing that I want to talk about is metabolic acidosis. This is something that's often very overlooked, but your kidney produces bicarbonate to correct metabolic acidosis. So there's good evidence that if you can increase your bicarbonate to over 23, that you can slow the rate of decline of kidney function. And basically that uh, if you uh, take sodium bicarbonate supplementation, you can save about six to eight uh, mLs per minute of GFR over three years. So we're talking two to three mLs per minute per year, uh, which is a huge amount, okay? So by taking bicarbonate, you can protect your uh, kidneys, People wonder, well, sodium bicarbonate has sodium in it. How about your blood pressure? And this just shows you there was no difference in blood pressure. Taking sodium bicarbonate is not the same as taking sodium chloride and salt. Uh, sodium bicarbonate does not appear to raise your blood pressure and it slows the progression of kidney disease. It improves nutritional status. When your body has too much acid, the way it 
corrects the acidosis, it leaches the bone and it uses the bone as a buffer. So it's actually very bad to have chronic untreated metabolic acidosis. It's very, very important to make sure you're, uh, you take bicarbonate supplementation. This just shows you the benefit of uh, protein restriction. Generally, the benefit is modest and basically um, we're talking uh, not huge uh, difference. You're probably saving maybe three to four months uh, with a very low protein diet. The patients generally don't do as well because they're malnourished when they start dialysis. So we don't recommend a very low protein diet just because you're to delay dialysis by three to four months, you're causing greater harm to the patient. So in our patient, basically, we're going to tell them not to smoke. Uh, if you smoke, you're 60% more likely to have cardiovascular disease. Uh, you're 160% more likely if you have a 30-pack year history of smoking. We're going to recommend people have a low salt intake. Uh, we're going to try to get people to the proper weight, try to do regular exercise every day, get their blood pressure less than 130 on 80. And we talked about using certain drugs like ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Uh, and then we talked about SGLT2 inhibitors, the Invocana and the Forziga. Uh, there's a new class of drugs also called GLP-1 receptor agonists. You'll see ads for Ozempic on TV. These are injections that are given once a week. And they also seem to have some benefit for cardiovascular disease. We want your sugars well controlled. We want your cholesterol low. And we would consider aspirin if you have established uh, heart, heart disease or stroke. Um, or you're at very high risk. We know that if your sugars are poorly controlled and you're diabetic, it increases the risk for development of not only kidney disease, but also the risk for blindness. Uh, we, cholesterol is something different. Um, basically, uh, we know that high cholesterol is bad in the general population. There was a study looking at uh, cholesterol in um, people with kidney disease called the SHARP study. And here, when they lowered cholesterol, they found a 17% reduction in atherosclerotic events. So heart disease, strokes, et cetera. So lowering cholesterol is also beneficial in people with kidney disease, all right? So generally we want the LDL cholesterol, um, we're aiming for less than 1.8, ideally less than 1.5, but at least below two. And basically again, anything to the left shows that there's a benefit. There was much lower events in the people on cholesterol medicine than patients not on cholesterol medicine. The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the people um, have uh, the potassium is in control, they're not uh, fluid overloaded, uh, that they're by bi there are bicarbonate uh, is given to them so they're not acidotic. Um, sometimes the potassium levels can go up, so they may need to avoid certain foods high in potassium. They may need to avoid oranges, bananas, tomatoes, uh, uh, seaweed. Certain foods are very, very high in potassium. Uh, and uh, basically, um, most of you, if you have chronic kidney disease, you can actually uh, access the uh, CKD program at the hospital and actually get an appointment with the dietitian to go over your diet. and. Specifically, they can go through all the different Chinese vegetables too. Certain vegetables are worse than others. But just to give you an idea of foods that are high in potassium, dried fruit, oranges, bananas, kiwi, nectarine, melons, uh, tomatoes, seaweed, certain types of beans, figs and dates are very high in potassium as well. Now, this is all can be very overwhelming, but I'd like to show you this study because it's very, very encouraging. So in Denmark, they did a study where they tried to control everyone's sugar very well, get the cholesterol down and get the blood pressure down. And this slide just shows you that as the patients that were able to achieve targets did much better. You can see that the patients that had uh, intensive therapy shown in the blue line versus the people that you know, did not have intensive therapy that if you follow people for like eight years, if you can control the blood pressure, control the sugar, control the cholesterol, then these patients do much, much better than people that where you have not controlled it properly. So we're really looking for a long-term benefit here uh, through tight sugar, tight blood pressure control, tight cholesterol control. And there are new drugs that are now available, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, 
your specialist would know about these drugs and would put you on these drugs. And we know that if you can control sugars, that you're less likely to have kidney disease, but also you're gonna save your eyes, save your vision. You can see that uh, kidney disease dropped by 61%, eye disease dropped by 58%, and you're gonna save your autonomic nerves. So autonomic nerves are nerves that, for example, prevent you from becoming dizzy when you stand up quickly, all right? There was no difference for peripheral neuropathy. It's also important to control your weight. Obesity is a bad thing in people with chronic kidney disease. And we know there are so-called metabolic syndrome where uh, there's waist circumference, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, high sugar. These are the five components of metabolic syndrome. And you can see that the more components you have for metabolic syndrome, the more likely you will develop chronic kidney disease, right? So basically we wanna control the weight. We wanna control the low uh, HDL, the high triglyceride. We wanna control the blood pressure and control the sugars. Finally, a little bit word on anemia. Um, your kidney produces a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. So when your kidneys are weak, you tend to not make as much of this hormone so often we will have to give you um, this hormone called erythropoietin to stimulate uh, bone marrow production. So often when you go on this hormone, uh, you'll need to take iron because a lot of patients will have iron deficiency as well and certain other vitamins. Sometimes if you have chronic inflammation, so inflammation is just um, from chronic illness. Sometimes your body is inflamed um, and you just, blood tests that we can do for chronic inflammation, that can also cause anemia as well. And also if your parathyroid gland is overactive, so the PTH, so your phosphorus is poorly controlled, that can also cause problems with anemia. So generally what we try to do is we're targeting your hemoglobin uh, to 100 to 110, and we're trying to correct um, an iron deficiency. And uh, these injections are usually given once a week, they can be given more often. Occasionally, we have to give intravenous iron. Um, there's a new class of drugs called HIF inhibitors that will be available as well in the very near, near future. I wanna spend a little bit of time on exercise because exercise, I think, is very, very important. And during COVID, I think with the lockdown, a lot of us have been indoors. I think a lot of people have gained weight. And I really like, um, when I talk to patients over the phone during the COVID pandemic, a lot of my patients have gained a lot of weight and it's reflected in worse sugars, higher blood pressure, higher cholesterol. So this just shows you that if you people do um, aerobic exercise and it doesn't have to be a uh, very strenuous exercise, it could just be walking, um, but they're 40% less short of breath, less 35% less itching, less um, feeling of fatigue. Exercise actually can actually make you feel a lot better and give you much better quality of life. So it's very, very important, I think, to do um, at least walking. If you can do some light weights, so like, like squats, like bending down or um, things to strengthen your muscles, then even better because people that have increased strength are less likely to fall and they have a lot of benefit. So this is something that's very important. You may not be exercising a lot right now, so you may have to start off gradually. So what you can do is, if you're not doing much, just go for 10 minutes and then gradually go to 15 and then go to 20, like gradually build up and go a little, walk a little bit faster over time, okay? So it's very, very important to do exercise because that'll really improve your quality of life. When I see patients in my office, the ones that exercise and the ones that don't exercise, there's a huge difference, especially the older you get, there's a huge difference in terms of quality of life. So it's very, very important to remain active. And also if you're a smoker, it's very important to quit smoking. And the earlier you quit smoking, the better. So this just shows you that if you're 30 years old and you quit smoking, you'll live 10 years longer. If you're, by the time, if you're in your 40 years old, you'll gain nine years of life And you, if you quit. If you're 50 and you quit smoking, you'll still gain six years of life. If you're 60 years old and you quit, you'll gain four years of life. So obviously, if you quit smoking at any age, you'll gain, uh, you'll increase your lifespan. But basically, the younger you quit, the better off you are. Don't forget for everyone, uh, if you have chronic kidney disease, 
it's important to get immunized. You should get your hepatitis B vaccination. Uh, hepatitis B can uh, be transmitted in a dialysis unit because we deal with blood. Um, and more likely, you're going to respond better to vaccines earlier on when you still have good kidney function. So once your GFR is around 30, you should be getting your family doctors to give you the hepatitis B vaccine. As you get older, you should all get the pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, um, um, there's a pneumovax uh, vaccine. Uh, the influenza vaccine is uh, recommended for everyone over the age of 50. Influenza has not been a big problem this year because uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm going to give you, at the end of this talk, a website. For those of you that live in Scarborough, if your GFR is below 30, then it doesn't matter your age, you automatically qualify for a COVID vaccine and you should all get vaccinated uh, for COVID-19. Um, basically, once your kidney function starts to get worse, you should be referred for um, vascular access if you're planning hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is a treatment where patients come into the hospital three times a week to get their blood cleaned on a kidney machine. And generally what we would like to do is connect the artery to the vein in the arm. And basically this provides an access. This takes about two months to heal. So ideally patients should have this done well in advance of needing dialysis. Perineal dialysis involves a catheter put into the abdominal cavity. And uh, basically this modality is preferred because um, it is, um, allows you to manage everything at home and it helps preserve your kidney function longer. So people on peritoneal dialysis continue to urinate for much longer than on hemo because it's a continuous process, much more gentle. Um, and so most generally we recommend people if they can manage to do peritoneal dialysis first. And once the peritoneal uh, membrane it no longer working very well, usually after five years, then they can switch to hemodialysis. Um, so a fistula is very, very important. It's much better than having a central line. And usually if you're right-handed, we'll put it in the left arm. And it's important like not to uh, put IVs or use that arm for, uh, to draw too much blood because we don't want to damage the uh, blood vessels. So finally, I want to talk about reversibility. Um, some of you have asked questions on how do I reverse my kidney failure? First of all, you want to avoid dehydration. Sometimes um, we do see people's kidney function get worse just because they're taking blood pressure medication and their blood pressure is dropped too low, all right? Some people need a blood pressure of 120, 130 minimum to maintain perfusion of their kidneys. And I occasionally see some people where the blood pressure drops to 100 and 110 and their kidney function gets a lot worse. And there could be that the blood pressure is too low. They're not perfusing their blood into their kidney well enough. So there we often stop some medicines and let the blood pressure come up to 120, 130. All right, so avoiding dehydration, make sure you, ensure you drink enough water. Um, a lot of your drugs are, can be damaging if you're, if you're not eating or drinking very well. So a lot of your diabetic pills, a lot of the water pills, a lot of the blood pressure medicines, a lot, uh, a lot of these drugs you should not take. On, if you're sick, you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and you're sick, you should be holding a lot of these medications on the sick days. Want to avoid drugs that can cause kidney failure or kidney problems. So we want to avoid like anti-inflammatory drugs, I already told you, they're over the counter, like Advil, Motrin, uh, Aleve. Uh, these are all very bad for your kidneys. The other thing that's very common is proton pump inhibitors. So a lot of you may have um, stomach problems. So you may be on Pantaloc or Tecta or, or uh, Periet or um, Nexium. Well, these drugs are also can be very harmful for your, for your kidneys. So you should not be on these drugs long-term if possible. Occasionally, if you have an underlying kidney problem like lupus, it, the kidney function is much worse. It could be a disease relapse. Um, we wanna rule out infectious causes. We wanna make sure you're not obstructed. So for older men, are you having dribbling, hesitancy, difficulty passing urine at night? Are you waking up three, four, five, six times a night to go to the bathroom? Is the urinary stream very, very weak? So if that's the case, maybe your prostate needs to be checked out, okay? Hypercalcemia, high calcium levels. So um, I don't recommend people take calcium supplements. You know, when I go to my parents' house, my mom's medicine cabinet was full of calcium tablets. 
So I just took it all and I threw it out because I often like people, old people think, oh, I should take calcium. I need calcium is good for me. Too much calcium is actually not good for you. It, inc it calcifies your blood vessels. And if your calcium levels go high, the blood flow to your kidney goes down. Make sure your blood pressure is well controlled. But as I said, you don't want to lower the blood pressure too low. Sometimes people go into heart failure. So symptoms are heart failure could be you can no longer lie flat in bed. You need to use extra pillows when you're sleeping at night. You may wake up very short of breath in the, way in, uh, in the middle of the night. Your ankles may become swollen or your weight starts going up. So that can also cause uh, kidney problems. And then interstitial nephritis is usually drugs. So we really talked about um, antibiotics we, uh, and we talked about the ulcer medication, the Panalog, those type of medicines. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, because it can cause worsening of your kidney function. So just to summarize, really, we want to treat reversible causes. We want to control your blood pressure to 130 on 80. We want to lower the protein in the urine. So we talked about ACE inhibitors, ARBs. We talked about SGLT2 inhibitors like Invulcana and Forsiga. We talked about aldosterone antagonism with drugs like Phenarinone, Spironolactone. We talked about the importance of correcting metabolic acidosis using sodium bicarbonate. And we don't want to just treat the kidneys. I already showed you that people with kidney disease are more likely to have heart disease. In fact, most of the patients I see with kidney problems never make it to dialysis because they die from a heart attack or stroke or something before they even go into kidney failure. So make sure you're on cholesterol medicine. If you're in a high risk category, like you've had to have stroke or heart attack before, you should be on low dose aspirin. If you're smoking, then please quit smoking. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of good diet and regular exercise. And then we want to treat the complications of decreased kidney function, controlling uh, your phosphorus levels, watching that in your diet, correcting low calcium, correcting low hemoglobin. And if your kidney function gets really bad, then we'd like to see you sooner rather than later. Nothing is more annoying than seeing a kidney patient um, you know, with a GFR of 10 for the very, very first time, because by then it's too late. We can't do very much to help fix things. So uh, a lot of it is awareness, but like we would rather see you sooner and intervene earlier so that we can delay the onset of your dialysis. And ba basically to plan for dialysis properly, we need several months to do this properly. So early referral to a kidney specialist or to a dialysis, a regional dialysis CKD program would be very, very helpful so that you can see the pharmacist, you can see the dietitian, you can see the social worker, uh, you can plan ahead for dialysis. This is the website for people that live in Scarborough, uh, www.scarbvaccine.ca. This is for the COVID vaccine um, for people. Um, if you have a GFR of less than 30 and you live in Scarborough, then you qualify for the COVID vaccine right away, right now. And if you register at this website, you'll get the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. Now, the appointments go very quickly, so you have to sometimes keep on checking regularly. Um, but basically, if uh, your GFR is less than 30, then you qualify for um, a vaccine. Also, if you don't have a GFR less than 30, if you have high blood pressure or you have diabetes and you live in Scarborough, you also qualify, all right? Um, if you don't live in Scarborough, if you are followed by a kidney doctor or a diabetes doctor or a family doctor who practices out of Scarborough, then you also qualify as well. So when you go for your vaccine, just bring your medication bottles and show the bottle with the doctor's name on it. And then you can also get a vaccine. If you go on the website, it will actually show you um, what uh, criteria there are. I strongly recommend everyone get the vaccine. Um, the third wave is now worse than the previous two waves. We're seeing a lot more um, variants. So the primary variant we're seeing now is the UK variant uh, from originally from Britain. It's uh, much more contagious and much more severe. So we're seeing a lot more young people in the ICU intubated. The ICU is full. We're having to helicopter patients out of the hospital right now. So if you can get the vaccine, I definitely recommend you get the vaccine. Um, if you're in certain groups, for example, if you've had a kidney transplant, then you should let them know when you go for the vaccine because right now they're delaying the vaccines by 16 weeks. 
uh, for the second dose. But if you've had a kidney transplant or anything like that, you let them know when they book you so that they will give you your second dose at three to four weeks after the first dose, all right? It's much better to get the second dose earlier if you qualify for it, if you're in a high risk group. So right now, I think uh, that's um, the end of what I wanted to talk about. I got a list of questions. Um, uh, can you guys all still see my screen? Sam, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, we can still see us. Okay, so I'm gonna just show you I apologize for going so quickly, but I, I do want to, I did want to cover as much as possible. Um, so these are some of the questions that were sent um, uh, by some of the patients, uh, and we'll go through some of them. If someone has bubbles in their, kid, their urine and traces of blood, yes. So if you have bubbles in the urine, if, usually that means protein. Uh, if you have protein in the urine and blood, um, if it's been over 10 years, it could be kidney illness. I could say if you've had it for 10 years and your kidney function is still normal, then it may be a condition called thin membrane disease, which can run in families. There will be other people in your family that have it, but generally it's not bad. Uh, if your kidney function starts to get getting worse, then for Asian people, the most common diagnosis is IgA nephropathy, which is not a benign condition. 20% will develop kidney failure within uh, 15 to 20 years. Someone will want to know about adrenal adenoma. The adrenal gland is above your kidney. It's a small gland that's right above the kidney. And an adenoma is a small tumor, usually benign. If it's above four centimeters, it has to be removed because above four centimeters are the high risk that it can be cancerous. Uh, adenomas can produce hormones. So the most common thing that we can see with blood pressure problems is you'll have a high blood pressure and low potassium. If your blood pressure is high and your potassium is low and you have a nodule on your adrenal gland, it's likely you have a condition called Kahn's syndrome. So there you're producing too much of a hormone called mineralocorticoids or aldosterone. What are the signs and symptoms of kidney disease? So the signs and symptoms of kidney disease unfortunately come very, very late. So you can have uh, lose over half your kidney function and you can feel perfectly fine. But the symptoms could be related to anemia, in which case you'd be short of breath, tired, no energy. Uh, a lot of people will develop itchy skin because of phosphorus accumulation under their skin, just generally feeling very tired. Their appetite may be decreased, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. So the tests that can detect kidney disease are the blood tests measuring the creatinine and the GFR, and also the urine. The urine tests a dipstick can detect for protein in blood and also the microalbumin albumin creatinine ratio, which is can detect um, protein that's abnormal even before you develop on the dipstick. So we really talked about how to prevent kidney function to decline. We talked about the importance of blood pressure control using ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, the importance of regular exercise, quitting smoking, low salt diet. Uh, no diabetic, no higher blood pressure, kidney functions, lower why. So basically, some people are born with smaller kidneys. Some people are born with only one kidney. Some people are with their premature baby. They may be born with small kidneys at birth. So really, you need to really um, uh, see a kidney specialist uh, to really go over this more carefully. The diet really to help you, um, you know, we talked about low protein diet, low salt diet, controlling uh, everything. Um, I think I, it's very, it's a very broad topic. Um, if a family member suffers from kidney disease, is it more likely the younger generation? So there is a familial component to kidney disease. So for example, if you're diabetic or have high blood pressure, it's more likely your children will have the same as well. And if you have certain kidney disease like polycystic kidney disease, those are transmitted genetically 50%. But a lot of other kidney diseases such as glomerulonephritis may not have a, a familial component. Certain autoimmune diseases like lupus, for example, can run in families as well. So some of them can, depends on what type of kidney disease, um, but yes, it, it can run in families. Um, how to prevent kidney disease, we talked about. Uh, the diet, we talked about low salt. Uh, if you have kidney problems, low potassium and low phosphorus and using bicarbonate supplementation uh, to eat more fruits and vegetables. Uh, if your potassium is okay. 
uh, maybe eating a little bit less meat, large, large quantities of meat. Kidney function is borderline. Uh, so we talked about that already. Uh, kidney functions drop down to 38. Well, you know, at 38, you have enough to stay off dialysis for the rest of your life. So basically all the things we talked about. Uh, angiomyolipoma at six millimeters, nothing to worry about. Angiomyolipomas are benign tumors of blood vessels, muscle, and fat. Uh, if they're above four centimeters, they can rupture, but at six millimeters, you don't need to do anything. It's nothing. I saw by Chinese herbal doctors, I have kidney weakness, anything to help. So basically all the things we talked about, blood pressure control, sugar control, cholesterol, um, uh, certain drugs that you can use. You do also have to be careful with Chinese herbs, okay? Chinese herbs, uh, there's one called mutong, uh, is causes uh, Chinese herbal nephropathy. So you can actually develop kidney failure from Chinese herbs. So it's, it's very important if you've seen an herbal doctor that you really know someone that knows uh, what they're doing and they don't give you anything that's contaminated. So mutong is used for weight loss. It's also used for arthritis. So just be careful. There's certain, you can look it up on the internet. It's called Chinese herbal nephropathy, uh, bristolokia. Um, and it's uh, very common when I was in China, when I asked for uh, mutong or aristolokia, the people would just hand it to me and I didn't want to touch it even because I thought such a bad medicine can damage your kidney. So you have to be careful with Chinese herbs. So this person had proteinuria, uh, swelling in the feet, 10 pounds heavier. Uh, GFR was normal. Okay, so the candesartan is good. That's the ARB. Um, the uh, wondering about, do they have acute kidney illness? So it really depends how much protein you have, but if you have a lot of swelling, you gain 10 pounds, I'd be worried that you have uh, developing nephrotic syndrome. Is your albumin level low? Is your cholesterol level high? These are all things, but basically you should be avoiding a, taking a low salt diet. But if you have a, lots of protein in the urine, you should be seeing a kidney specialist. Number two, diabetic over 30 years, GFR 52, album current ratio 34.2. Okay, so first of all, you're diabetic. You should be on, you have lots of protein in the urine. You should be on an ACE inhibitor or ARB. So either like uh, um, some, a drug that ends with PRIL, P-R-I-L, or a drug that ends with SARTAN, S-A-R-T-A-N, ACE or ARB. You should be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. So you should be on dapagliflozin or canagliflozin. So the drugs are for Zika or Invocana. You should be on, um, probably be on a diuretic. Your blood pressure should be less than 130 on 80. You should be on cholesterol medicine. If you still have lots of protein, maybe go on a uh, spironolactone or aldosterone antagonist. Uh, sorry, Dr. Tang. Um, uh, we are actually at 2.58 and we have to stop at 3 o'clock. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so time flies. Uh, I know we have some questions on the floor. Uh, but unfortunately, we we um, we will have to stop the question uh, Q and A for today. Uh, but once again, I just want to, uh, on behalf of the Kidney Foundations of Canada and also Chinese Renal Associations, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Ting for his uh, wonderful uh, presentations and all the informations. Um, I, I apologize for the information overload. It's a lot of ground <laughs> to cover in one hour. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, some quite uh, the. The PowerPoint slide, uh, you can send us an email and we can- uh, uh, Yeah, Sam has a copy of the PowerPoint. So anyone that wants a copy of the PowerPoint, they're welcome to have it. Yeah, and um, just one of, uh, in the last one minute, um, we will have another session in next week or next Saturday at two o'clock on more about on the treatment options. I understand we, uh, some, some of the attendees have some big questions about uh, treatment options and on the panel as well. Uh, sorry, um, on the platform as well, and uh, we we'll, we can definitely uh, raise it up to uh, the next speaker, uh, Doctor Mushi, uh, on next uh, Saturday. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take thank care. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.